Give me the Bible's star of Cadillac's give me to cheer the wanderer on a tempest tossed. No storm can hide that peaceful radiance. Give me, since Jesus came to seek and save the Lord. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the night away. Precept and promise, love and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, colleagues, wherever you are. And welcome to our present truth talk show. We are discussing the Sabbath school quarterly for the fourth quarter of the year 2023. My name is Oliver Chikuta and I'll be your host today. With me here to discuss this important lesson on missions, I have uh, Brother Brown who will take us for the Sunday lesson, Elder Michael will take us for Monday, Our Brother Kampamba will take us for Tuesday, for Wednesday we have uh, Elder Stephen and our brother Delight. Let me ask Elder Michael to give us a word of prayer. Lord Almighty, we give you all the thanks and adoration. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us. As we begin this session, let your Holy Spirit be with us. We thank you and give you all the glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for answering our prayers. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that I pray. Amen. I want to take this opportunity to thank all our viewers. And listeners, value your support, your subscriptions, sharing of this important information. We are on lesson four in a series of lessons, uh, God's mission, my mission. Today, we have an interesting topic, sharing God's mission, sharing God's mission. To start the ball rolling, we will read our memory text from book of John chapter 13, verses 34 to 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciple. If you have love one for another, I will take it again. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. From this memory text, you can see that the admonition to love one another comes several times. There is a triple emphasis on the need to love one another, meaning that love for one another is indispensable if we are to accomplish God's mission to win the world to the kingdom of heaven. Now, from the start, Abraham wanted to, to be used by God for mission. This truth can be seen, for example, this is chapter 18 from verses 1 to verse 33, when God warned him about what was going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. Surely, the Lord God does nothing, does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. That's according to Amos chapter 3, verse 7. And in the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham was the servant, the prophet, whom he told his secret, whom he told what he was about to do to this disgraceful city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham was resting during the heat of the day when he saw three travelers. And to Abraham, these were ordinary travelers, uh, wayfarers who were tired, um, thinking one of them could be a god. Abraham never thought about this. He just thought these were just wayfarers who were traveling. But Abraham now, he invited them to his tent and gave hospitality to them. Abraham, however, soon became personally involved in God's mission. His involvement 
is revealed in this chapter, that's Genesis chapter 18, was to pray for and intercede for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. That is, he wanted to see if somehow these people, despite themselves, could be saved. In a sense, if this is not what mission is all about, I don't know what it is. But throughout this chapter, three great spiritual qualities of Abraham are revealed. That is hospitality, love, and prayer. And these are the qualities that are expected in everyone who is going to be involved in God's mission, hospitality, love, and prayer. As we proceed with our lesson, we are going to hear from Brother Brown about the gift of hospitality. What is this gift of hospitality and how is it useful in accomplishing God's mission? Over to you, Brother Brown. Sharing God's mission. You may think by sharing God's mission means you have to be extremely competent. Uh, when Moses was asked to go to Pharaoh, he said he's not eloquent that he could speak to Pharaoh. Some of us may think we don't know about the 28 fundamental beliefs, although we did accept them to become a Seventh-day Adventist, but we don't know them in detail to share properly with someone. And here comes on Sunday's lesson, an aspect of sharing mission, which I believe all of us can do. Hospitality, just being welcoming to persons that we see as a part of sharing God's love that is within you. That is a part of God's love. There is no fear in God's love. That when you see persons in this world of sin and corruption and violence, you should fear them, but you can welcome them and you can treat them well. You can offer them a drink and bid them farewell if they need to carry on. So this is what Sunday is trying to talk to us about. Let us go to Genesis 18 and let's look at a few parts of Genesis 18, verse 2. And it says that, and he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. I pray thee from thy servant, let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that, ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, so do as thou hast said. And I stop at verse six. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. Knead it and make cakes upon the hearth. Now, in those times, they didn't have certain modes of transportation like us. These guys, ladies, they had to walk miles to reach their destinations. Right? People living within a particular location, people who are very close to each other, it's their own kindred more than likely. In some rural parts of some countries, it's similar. You have a particular tribe in this place. You have a particular family or a lot of family members living within one community whether rural or in a city, but it mainly happens usually in the rural parts. And here comes persons who are passing through or passing by. In today's world, we're saying probably they're driving by and they're just a bit tired and they want to stop or they're in a bus and they're walking. They've driven a part of the way and now they're walking to the, of their destination. There are some key things here. He was at his door tent, as a quarterly would say, just sitting down in the heat. You might say in today's world, I would not sit down in the heat. But he sat down in the heat, looking out for persons. That's something key there. God put him there for a purpose, to look out for persons. Sacrifice self and say, although it is hot, I'm going to stay here because if a passerby is coming by, I want to tend to them. In communion service, foot washing is something of humility. Persons don't normally want to do that because people's feet are normally very dirty. They're just wearing a sandals. Abraham humbled himself. He sacrificed himself first to be out in the heat so that if anybody's passing by, he could see them. He humbled himself to say, let me wash your feet. Let me fetch some water to wash your feet. 
Maybe we don't have to do that now, but the, the persons you see might be thirsty, you offer them a drink. They might be a little bit hungry, so Abraham says, let me get a morsel. And he didn't just get a morsel of bread. He asked their fine meal. The Good News Version says the best cakes. That is putting your guests that you don't even know, strangers, first. That is truly the love of God. You didn't have something left over from last night and you said, let me warm this and give them. Sarah, get this out of the fridge and warm it and no. The best fine meal. Another aspect here showing the love of God. So this is what hospitality is about. God putting in, in your hearts to entertain persons who you see, total strangers, in a loving manner. Because Hebrews 13 verse 2 says, don't forget hospitality. For by it, some have hosted angels without knowing it. Or we have entertained angels unawares without knowing it. We have to show forth hospitality to these people. These key attributes were mentioned here about Abraham. And then another thing, wherever Abraham went, he would set up, so wherever he is living, he would set up altars to show how he would worship. And whenever he left that place and he went somewhere else, those altars remained. Worldly person, Canaanites that were passing by at that time, any person could come by and they know of Abraham's God. They would see this altar that was left there and they would honor Abraham's God. How is our worship life? Can people see by the life that we are living that we are truly connected with God? That even when we are not even around, we have been out of the village for a while, we've been out of the community for a while, they still are somehow connected with God and they miss us and the fact that we were so connected with God and always a true and genuine worshiper of God. That is what the lesson is trying to point out to us here. The love of God must be in us so much that we want to give of our best to persons who we don't even know because God loves, crucify itself, put us at a position where we could say, oh, that's not our comfort zone. It is hot outside, but we stay outside looking for persons to show hospitality to them. You don't need to know the Bible to be able to know this and to do this well. You just have to ask God for that spirit of love and not of fear so that when persons pass by, you don't suspect that these persons might be here for the wrongdoing, but you show love to them. Because God said, the least you have done to these, my brethren, you have done it unto me to give a drink to those who are thirsty to give clothes to those who are naked, to give food to those who are hungry. Let us, brethren, in every way that we can. It may not be a passerby, it may be a visitor who has come to our home, be hospitable to them, treat them well, especially if they're not of the whole soul, so that when they leave, they have left with a mark that you have made on them from God. Amen. Back to you, Elder. Thank you, Dabran. How comfortable are strangers in your home? How open is your home to neighbors? To family members, are people comfortable coming to your home, prepared to part with a little bit of your comfort for the sake of your neighbor, for the sake of the stranger, the wayfarer who is passed by? Let's go to the next day and look at Abraham's love for everyone. I think the emphasis is about love, loving one another. It's key to mission. Yes, Elder, take us through Abraham's love for everyone. Elder Michael. Thank you very much, Elder Oliver. And God bless you, Brother Brown, for the good work done. Listeners, we are moving on to the next lesson that is captioned, Abraham's love for everyone. As Elder said, the key word here is love and also everyone. This lesson presented Abraham's constant love for all people regardless of their background, beliefs, race, languages, and so on. Despite the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham's compassion, his love, extended to its inhabitants, hoping for their redemption. The story is about Sodom and Gomorrah. When God decided to destroy these people, it took Abraham's love to intercede for these people. Although from the Bible, we are told that they were evil or very wicked. So it was time for God to end their lives. But Abraham interceded for them. Abraham's love for everyone in this lesson is evident in his conversation with God about the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah. Even though 
God informed him of their impending destruction due to their grievous sins. But Abraham boldly interceded on their behalf. Abraham's plea to God in the lesson reflects his belief in the inherent goodness of humanity and the possibility of repentance. Abraham, again, in the lesson, recognized that even the most wicked individuals have the potential for change. And I want to emphasize here, listeners, no one is doomed. There is change for each and everyone, no matter where you find yourself. Abraham recognized that it is possible for those quote and unquote wicked people to change. And he appealed to God's mercy to grant them the chance to turn away from their sin. So Abraham's love for all people stemmed from his understanding of God's boundless love for humanity. He also knew that God desired the salvation for all. And he mirrored this love in his concern for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. If I'm putting myself in Abraham's shoes, the question I want to ask myself personally is that, can I do this? This kind of love is not possible. It's not common in our daily lives here. We, we would rather call for their destruction. But here, Abraham called for God's mercies to be stored upon these people. Abraham's example teaches us that the love should not be limited by boundaries. We shouldn't have limitations when it comes to love. If we love someone, there's nothing that should prevent us from doing anything for them, even if they hurt us. True love extends to all, even those who may seem beyond redemption. Let's continue to love one another. When there is any chance to portray, to show our love to one another, let's do it. Regardless of our races, of our languages, and of our beliefs, let's continue to love one another. By doing so, we are spreading the gospel message because God is love. It is a love that seeks the best for others. Even when we have strayed far from righteousness, it is only going to take love to cause a sinner to the cross of Jesus. So in this lesson, it is very simple. Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah because of his love to mankind and to everyone. Abraham love for everyone says as a powerful reminder, listeners, to all of us, let's cultivate compassion for each and everyone, regardless of our circumstances and choices. It is love that reflects the divine love that embraces all. We shouldn't forget that in this lesson, we can learn to believe in the power of repentance. There is time for everything. We can also learn to reflect God's love to each and everyone. Lastly, we can advocate for others and hope for salvation for all. I pray that listeners and all of us will try to love each one and everyone. May the Lord bless us all. Amen. Thank you, my elder. Sometimes you wonder why we hate each other, why we hate sinners. Hate God did everything and is still doing everything to save sinners. What is your attitude? towards sinners because only those who love sinners will make every effort to win sinners to Christ. Brother Kampam, tell us what are we expected to do? Thank you, Yoda. Uh, Mamuka say, Masura say, today we are greeting Zimbabwe. Last week we greeted Jamaica. Today we're greeting Zimbabwe and Solomon Island. Unfortunately, I don't know how to greet in any of the native languages. But then we greet you as well. We continue with our lesson. We're looking at Abraham and the lesson that we can get. Mission is the main title. Abraham has received visitors. After he has received these visitors, the three men are now going. Genesis 18, in verse 22, it says, the men turned away and went towards Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. 23, then Abraham approached him and said, will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? 25, far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. 
far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? 26, then the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the hopeless for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I'm nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five people? If I find 45 there, he said, I will not destroy. Lot is in that city. But then we see something that is happening. Prayer. This is kind of a prayer. And we call this type of prayer intercessory prayer. He's praying on behalf. This is the kind of prayers that we are also invited to have. Besides our own prayers, where we pray for health, where we pray for security, we pray for riches and everything. We are also in that mission to also have intercessory prayers, to pray for the well-being of others. The well-being of others is not only limited to your society. The well-being of others is not only limited to your church. No, it, it is not limited. Actually, it should decentralize to each and every person. Because remember the mission, the aim is to reach everyone outside, everyone in the whole world. Abraham talking to God. And it's so interesting that first he starts with 50 and God says, I will not destroy the city. And then with humbleness, with humility, he says, okay, I'm just a man, but please, sorry. Okay, I want to ask what if it will be 30? Then again, he goes down and down asking. We see him like he's affected. He feels the pain. What if these people are destroyed? I remember when something does bad. One day I was talking to a certain lady, a certain person had done something bad to her, I think. Then in our local language, we say, like God will see him. When someone says God will see him, they don't really mean seeing him in a nice way. They mean revenge. So I said, uh, yeah, you, God will see him, but not in the way that you think you'll see him. Because God actually went and uh, visited Paul, but not in the way that you think. Because he went and visited Paul and changed his heart. So definitely God is going to visit those people, but not in the way that you think. He's a merciful God and willing that everyone comes to repentance. And there's joy in heaven when in one person, one person converts. We are being shown the type of prayers that we should have as missionaries. Pray, intercessory prayer. Pray for each and every person. Is there a pastor whom you think is preaching the wrong message? Pray for them. Are there people that you're so concerned about? Pray for each one of them. But then are we just speaking this from our mind? Is it something that we have just made up? Let us look at a verse in James chapter 5. Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The Bible is saying don't pray for yourself alone. Pray for others and that such prayers are very effective. Prayers of a righteous man are effective, the Bible says. Let us be in the habit of praying for each other. Kneel down and pray for that brother of yours. Kneel down today and just pray for that sister. I know you have your own issues. You, have, you want school fees, you want food. For now, you've eaten, it's okay. Just put them aside and pray for Elder Chikuta today. Like, make it today. I'm praying for Elder Chikuta and pray for him. That is what the Bible wants us to do. We see the love that Abraham had. We are given example. We see Abraham standing in for Christ. He was doing what Christ was coming to do. Before Christ came, we see Abraham standing in, doing what Christ is coming to do. And this is what Christ is doing right now. In the heavenly sanctuary, Christ is praying for each and every one of us. In Hebrews 7.25, it says, therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to him through God, because he always lives to intercede for them. Christ always lives to intercede for each and every one of us. And let us also have the mind of Christ to intercede for others. Thank you and have a blessed week. Thank you very much, Brother K, for that powerful expose. Do you want to have a conversation with God? Abraham had one. If you want to have a conversation with God, get involved in mission. Do you want to have a deeper experience? with God. If you want to have a deeper experience with God, engage in intercessory prayer. Pray for others. Then you have a deeper experience with God. How do you feel when you hear that this world is going to be destroyed? 
Do you think about your mother who is not yet a believer, who has not yet accepted Jesus? Do you think about your brother? Do you think about your neighbor, your workmate? Do you think about your schoolmate who is yet to receive Jesus? May that push you, may that compel you to share the message of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus with those friends and neighbors. Basically those in Italy, I want to say to Brother Ishmael, I'm going to do, I want to say happy Sabbath to Simba. God bless you for always listening into our program. I want to look at Abraham's mission. Ashes and earth. These words are used interchangeably. Paul tells us that we shouldn't grow weary of entertaining visitors, doing hospitality. By so doing, some have ended up world entertaining angels. We say the angel of the Lord, it's two application. Once it represents Christ. Another instance is to represent an actual angel. In this particular story, said, who has veiled his godly nature with humanity. So he, when he said, let us go and see for ourselves, it was Christ that Abraham and the family actually entered. We want to look at the results of this particular entertainment. What was the results? What was the outcome of the prayer, of the good deeds, of the hospitality that Abraham played? We also want to look at the similarities between Lot and Abraham. Why does God even entertain the sin in such a way that sinners live longer. We want to find answers to these particular stories and the applications in our day. There were five cities. We normally refer them to the Pentecost. Sodom and Gomorrah even though dominate. There are five cities. Let me mention those cities for your learning. Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zibwe, and Zoa, which is known as Bela. These were the five cities. Or you can also saw the Pentecost cities that were Destroyed. We are told in Genesis chapter 19, you can read the whole of Genesis 19, verse 1 is 29 for context. But we want to concentrate and pick some important nuggets from this story. 19, verse 1 says, Lord was sitting in the gates of Sodom. When you read 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 8, when Absalom rose against the leadership of his father David, when his commander in chief, Joab had defeated the army of Absalom, and Absalom died. When David heard of it, we are told this story that he came to sit at the gate. When you open to Jeremiah chapter 38, verse 7, when Jeremiah was thrown into prison, one of the Enochs, who was from Ethiopia, known as Abidemalek, also was sitting at the gate. When we read the story of Ruth, Boaz, who became the husband of Ruth, also sat at the gate. So, we cannot definitely tell exactly the vision of Lot in this particular context, but he might hold a very important vision. Let's look at the similarities. There are parallels between Genesis 19 and Genesis 18. Both met the angel of sitting at the entrance or the gate. The specific is Abraham and Lot each prepare food for this visitors. Despite the characteristics, despite the force that you read, despite the discontentment of Lot, in choice, being even greedy in his choice. Even all that, the intercessive prayer we've already learned from his brother have actually played a very important role. And I don't know why he shared this good characteristics. Let's read this chapter 19, verse 24 and 25. And the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. And the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew these cities, all the plains, all the inhabitants of the cities, and with grew on the ground. The Bible does not tell us the exact population in these five cities. But among these thousands of people, only four left the city. And unfortunately, only three were saved. When the Lord said he did not find five righteous people that could have led him sparing the five cities. He was right because only three people were saved. A love and his two daughters. In the number of residents of Sodom, the implication for us in our generation is that not everyone will be saved. As Christ said, many are called by him are chosen. We are like those people who live. When Christ preached the message of salvation, only few people followed. He has given us free will. The task for us is not to go there 
to tell people how poor they are, okay. to point their poor to the nose. Our task is to invite them to make a choice, whether for Christ or against him. And the free will that we have means that at the end, it's not everyone who is going to be saved. We have to pray as Abraham interceded for his speech. We have to pray that God will help individuals to make the right choice. And before I end, let me read from my favorite Christian author, Ellen Goodwine, the light he shares in her book, The Great Controversy, page 503. Please, I want you to grab a copy of this. It's a very, very good book for our dispensation, and especially once we are in it. In sparing the life of Cain, the Medrash, God gave the world then an example of what would be the result of permitting a sinner to live a continual course of unbridled iniquity through the influence of Cain's teachings. For example, more few of his descendants were led into sin. As we read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 and 11, the wickedness of men was great on earth, and every nation of the thoughts of the heart were evil continually. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. The world, God blotted out the wicked inhabitants in no time. In mercy, he destroyed the corrupt in wellness in Sodom. Through the deceptive powers of Satan, the works of iniquity obtain sympathy and admiration, and are thus constantly leading others to rebellion. It was so in Cain's and Noah's days, and in the time of Abraham and in Lot, and it is so in our time. If it's mercy to the universe that God will finally destroy the rejectors of his grace. Before Lot and the daughters got Zohar, remember Lot pitched his tent near to Sodom and Gomorrah, but he gradually landed there. When he was asked to run to the plains, he said it was far. Then he requested that they give him the chance to live close to Zohar. They allowed. When he reached there, we were told the sun had risen. It was business as usual. The rays of light were sparkling, and the people thought that it was going to be a prosperous and peaceful day within the cities. Later, did they know that a stir of active life has begun in the street, and men were going through their various streets, intended that business was going to be as usual. Sin laws of Lord were making marry at the fears and warnings of his wicked minded bold man. But suddenly, that is a sad part. Suddenly and unexpected, as it were tender and perils from the unclouded sky, the tempest broke, the Lord rain brimstone and fire out of heaven upon the cities and the fruitful plain, palaces and temples, mostly dwellings, gardens and vineyards, and they gave pleasure loving throne that were only the night before had been suffered, the messengers of heaven all were consumed. This taught us that fearful and solemn lessons that while God's mercy is long with the transgressor, there is a limit beyond which men may not longer go on to sin. When that limit is reached, then the offer of mercy are withdrawn and the ministration of judgment begins. This is from the book Patriot and Prophets, page 16. May the Lord help us as we do not take God's leniency for his weakness. As we live close to the line of probation, May we optimize and make use of this opportunity of grace that has been given me so that we don't land up when you start to begin to do the statistics and the mathematics and the simulations. It tells the unto the living world, few were saved in long time. Only four people left, only three were saved. Then you can do the mathematics for yourself. May God bless us as we give all our all in the service. Amen. Thank you, Elder, for those insights. Yes, we are living at the very fringe at the edge of the close of probation. May the hospitality that was in Lord and Abraham be found in us, not willing that any opportunity to minister may pass us by. Every opportunity that presents itself, not only presents itself, but even looking for the opportunities to save others. Like Lord would go to the gate of the city to invite people to his house. So was the character of Abraham. That's why he could invite those strangers to his house. Let's take an effort. Let's make it a deliberate thing to go and invite people to our houses and to invite them 
to Christ. Thank you very much for that presentation. Now we go to Thursday, where we are talking about submission to God's will. Submission to God's will. Brother Delight Tonra is going to take us through what is submission to God's will in this case. A wonderful evening, afternoon to our dear listeners. Thank you once more for joining us. And thank you to those who have learned the lesson before me. I'm also happy to be part of this panel as we continue with God's mission, my mission. And it's also your mission, dear fellow our listener. Continue on Thursday, which is the last lesson of this week. It says submission to God's will. The key word we have here is submission, as we are going to discuss on Thursday. Submission to God's will. Thinking, what does it take for one to submit to God's will or to submit to other person's will? It takes one to deny his own pleasures. It takes one to deny or even to forget what he wants or his plans. So that's the same topic we are going to talk about on Thursday, that we have gone to an extent where one has forgotten even his cares, his pleasures, his plans. He has forgotten that he has to do something and he has taken that the will of God to be his will. That is submission to God's will. I'm going to continue with Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 9, where we see the Lord has spoken to Abraham and told him to leave his people, his riches, his inheritance, his acquaintances, and to leave everything to go to a land where he will call him. One of the things that makes Abraham called a father of faith was his ability to submit to God's will. And what does it mean to us? We are going to learn using Abraham as a case study. We have qualities that we have to learn from Abraham, one of which we already mentioned was his power to submit to God's will and all the experiences which were characterized by him to make whom Abraham was. The first thing we are going to talk about on Genesis chapter 12 is his calling. If you read with me from Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And this is a call that God is giving to Abraham out of the blue. But today, as we are having lesson during the Sabbath school in the morning, I remember there was a question that, how do I know that this is God speaking? I was thinking, even now I've been thinking. So I've come to the conclusion that the moment that we accept that we are Christians, we have accepted the call that God has given us. Remember, we go back to Matthew 28. I think we learned it in the previous weeks where God was saying he makes us disciples to go to the world to make disciples. Once we are Christians, we have accepted the call. How do we know that the Lord is sending us now to a land? The purpose or the point that we are already in a mission, we have already taken the mission. It means whatever mercy or whatever situations a place us that's our place of divine appointment for those who are in china god has placed us here for a special decision same as abraham abraham was called to leave his land to go to a land of Haran. we also learned that he went to egypt and he came back to a place where he had built an altar for god so that was his place of divine appointment mainly for the fulfillment of God's mission. But in all this, one thing that I would want to take on his calling is that Abraham was able to submit to the will of God. He was able to submit to God's calling. As we read with me from Genesis chapter 12, verse 4, it says, So Abraham went, and the Lord taught him. And Lot went with him, and Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. This is now the age of Abraham. After all, Maybe we may think that Abraham was old. What was he to think about? This is the same point that I'm giving to us, dear followers, dear listeners, that no matter our age, no matter our circumstances, when God has placed us in a certain position, when God has called us, let us submit to his calling. And the second quality we'd want also to learn is the choice of land. So in Genesis chapter 13, verse 14, now we have stressed, the history of Abraham when they have left Ab Egypt, right? And it's the time they've left Egypt. So he said now they went back to a place which was between Bethel and Ai. They had a quarrel with a Lord who was his nephew because of pasture. But Abraham now, because of his humility, he says he didn't want any quarrels. He gave Lord that ability to choose first. Where would you want to go? And Lord, like any of us, he chose a land which was good in pasture. 
which was near Sodom. If you read from Genesis chapter 13, verse 14 and 15, and it says, The Lord said to Abraham, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward, and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give you and your offsprings forever. Now, because Abraham submitted to the will of God, now because Abraham was humble enough to let Lot choose first, the Lord now is choosing a land for Abraham. And he's saying, because you have submitted, I will give all this land to your descendants. The promise of God is fulfilled as he has promised. The point that I would want us to glean from this is that the Lord, the verses that I like is that, for we know God has set boundaries. The Lord has set boundaries for some of us. The Lord has demarcated time and space where he said, this is the light. This is your boundary where you're going to operate. You will never exceed this tunnels. But I want to bring to us that the Lord has set boundaries for us. Some of us, we have been set boundaries in Africa. Some of us, we have been placed boundaries, maybe in Asia. Some of us, where wherever grace finds us, God has placed us strategically in different spaces and time. For he has chosen a land for us, for the purpose of his mission that we might fulfill. As we finish on Thursday, also there's another quality here. I think the previous speakers have been speaking about the issue of Sodom and Gomorrah. So there is the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. God revealed to Abraham what was the destiny of Sodom and Gomorrah, that it was going to be destroyed. Why? Because of the sin that had grown in Sodom and Gomorrah. But... Abraham, because he submitted to the will of God, yes, he pleaded that God, he might save or spare Sodom and Gomorrah. But at the end, Abraham submitted to the will of God and accepted God's judgment for these cities. So I want to bring us to this point. That some of us, it's really hard to submit to the judgments of God in our lives. Some of us, it's even hard for us to submit where God has ruled, where God has said, I've closed this door, I've opened this door. It's hard for us to submit the judgments of God. Like Abraham, my dear fellows, brothers and sisters in Christ, we ought also to learn to submit to the judgments of God. Whatever situations that have happened in our life, God has placed us strategically. Some of us, we have lost spouses. Some of us, we have lost parents. Some of us, we have lost even siblings or friends, people who are close, close to us. But because of all these situations, God has judged. And these purposes have grown us, have, have brought us closer to the completion of his mission. As I close, I want to read the last line here the author wrote for us. He says, the Lord was able to use Abraham because of his submission to God in all circumstances. So my dear listener, as you listen in this evening, this morning, the lesson on Thursday, it says, God is willing to use you. What he requires of you is to submit in all circumstances, be it of place where you are, be it of the judgment that he has given around you, be it of the situations or the circumstances that has happening to you. God is asking you to submit that he might choose you. It must be the same with us today. In as much as Abraham submitted, God is also calling us to submit to his will. May all be blessed in his word. Amen. Thank you, Brother Delight, for that explanation. If you read from the book, Patrick's and Prophets, page 140, love for perishing souls inspired Abraham's prayer. While he loathed the sins of that corrupt city, he desired that the sinners might be saved. His deep interest for Sodom shows the anxiety that we should feel for the impenitent. We should cherish hatred of sin, sin, but pity and love for the sinner. All around us are souls going down to ruin as hopeless, as terrible as that which befell Sodom. Every day the probation of some is closing. Every hour, some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. And where are the voices of warning and entreaty to bid the sinners flee from this fearful doom? Where are the hands stretched out to draw him back from death? Where are those who, with humility and persevering faith, are pleading with God for him? That's the question. Are we there pleading? for the perishing souls. Now, as we close, 
I would like to ask our panelists to just give some snippets, some takeaways in just 30 seconds each. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. May we pray that he will give us that love and a sound mind, that we will trust his spirit as he leads, and we will help these people who pass us by, who come into our home, to know who we truly serve, the God of Israel, so that when they leave, we have left a lasting mark on them, that will draw them into a closer relationship with God. Amen. Abraham's love for everyone, this lesson reminds us to love unconditionally. Let's all try to believe in the power of repentance and try to love each and everyone equally. May the Lord bless us and keep us. This is a sermon to all of us. Amen. Sorry, prayer. So besides the many prayers that you have, all the prayers you have, devote time. Make time. Let us make it a habit to just have time to pray for others. Thank you very much. I want to say I'm so glad to be part of this wonderful mission that Abraham, Lord, and others exhibited through hospitality. Our responsibility as contemporary people who are living close to Sodom and Gomorrah is to become active person, advancing the cause of God. We are to be missionaries, and that should be our chief aim in winning souls for Christ. To his church, God has committed the work of diffusing life and bearing the message of his love. Our work is not to condemn, no, not to denounce, no, but to draw with Christ, beseeching men to reconcile to God. We are to encourage souls to attract them and thus win them for our Savior. May the Lord help us and give us the strength to go on these missions for him. Amen and amen. Thank you very much. So, dear listeners, God is calling us to submit to his will, to forget what we want, to forget and to hide all our wants in what he has called us to go, to go and go with the mission. Amen. Beloved panelists, for sharing with us on the various lessons we learned uh, from this uh, particular study. And to our listeners and viewers, if you want to participate in this sharing of the mission, Please subscribe, please share the link for this platform uh, with friends. And by so doing, you are also a partaker in God's mission. Really value your comments and questions. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to use the chat uh, section or the comment section. to we'll try level best to answer uh, any questions that come. With this, I want to thank you all for making time to listen, to watch this presentation. And we are going to close with a prayer from Brother Kampamba. Let us pray. Almighty Father Jehovah God, Lord, we thank you for the word that you've given us to hear. Thank you that you are God and thank you that you care for us. We thank you for the life of Abraham, that you've helped us to learn and fast us to emulate. Be with each and every one of us. Protect us even as we go through this week. Leave everything in your hands. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And once again, we meet next week. Same channel with your same presenters. May God bless you. May his message be upon you. Till we meet again. Amen. Give me the Bible, star of Cadillac's gleaming, to cheer the wanderer lone and tempest-tossed. No storm can hide that peaceful radiance gleaming, since Jesus came to seek and save the Lord. Give me the Bible, holy message shining, Thy light shall guide me in the night away. Precept and promise, love and love combining, till night shall vanish in eternal day. Give me the Bible, all oh, my steps enlighten. Teach me the danger of these rocks below. 
That lamp of safety, all the gloom shall brighten. Thy light alone, that part the peace can show. Give me the Bible, holy message shining. Thy light shall guide me in the narrow way. Precept and promise, love and love combining. Till not your back, 